business of life. Chances are you listen to music pretty regularly, but how often do you pay for it? Spend just $10 a month for a streaming service and that's all you need. All your favorite bands right there. But does that utopia for listeners mean poverty for musicians? And does it have to be that way? Well, tonight we're going to find out, and as always, we'll break down the issues in facts, figures, dollars, and cents. I'm joined by a panel of uniquely qualified experts eager to answer the question, what is the business of music? Let us start off with our first statistic, 3.3 million. That's the number of albums Adele sold in one week when she released the album 25 in November 2015. That same week, it set another record by making up 41% of all album sales. Joe, Adele is an outlier here, right? Is she just the 1% of musicians? Yeah, I mean, that stat is exceedingly strange. Mm. Not only is it essentially impossible, like a unicorn in today's music retail climate, yeah. but that she did it in a time, a completely different era, in a time when people simply don't buy records anymore. How did she do it? So Adele did a really important thing, which was activating an audience that is not who we think of as a, as a, a traditional record a record consumer in, in the current market. Okay, older, who is that audience? Older, older. Um, someone who's conditioned to paying $16 for mm. a CD. Stephen, are you surprised that one physical album sold so well? I think it's a statement that music is very diverse. It's more diverse in terms of distribution channel, monetization opportunities than really at any time in history. Other artists are trying to come up with ways to make people excited to uh, acquire their music, however the they might acquire copies. it. I don't think the physical object is the thing. To John's point, I don't think anybody wants the physical object unless it's vinyl unless they are older. For now, we want to talk about these physical album sales, and this next stat can help us illustrate that. Not so long ago, album sales looked completely different. In the year 2000, there were 730 million sales of physical album recordings. By 2008, that number had been cut in half to 363 million. And by the end of 2015, that number had dropped by more than half again to just under 125 million albums. Joe, that steep decline is happening really, really quickly. Why? Because nobody wants to buy a record when you can get it for free. I mean, your difference between 2000 and 2008 is nobody had to buy those records. Is there no nostalgia for the physicality of an album at all? Well, that's what vinyl's about. Vinyl is merch. I feel like if you want to demonstrate loyalty to an artist that you like, you have a way of spending $25. You can put it up on your mantle at your house. People know that you're super into the white stripes. And you can communicate that to your friends when they come over. Stephen, do so those vinyl sales make a difference to the artists? Most people that are buying vinyl are also streaming that content, but they want to have that physical good. So it's a, it's a way of incrementally monetizing your customer, your fan. After all this talk about streaming, this next number may surprise you. 317 billion. That's the number of music streams in 2015. It's close to double the number of streams in 2014, but for most musicians, those extra streams aren't bringing in extra dollars. Just look at the royalties streaming services are paying. At the top, Google Play at 73 thousandth of a cent per play. At the bottom is YouTube at three ten thousandths of a cent. Stephen, those numbers are really, really appalling. I think it's actually the opposite. In many ways, streaming is saving the music industry and it's really restoring the growth that the industry has been missing for years. Streaming is the primary, is going to be, and is today, particularly among millennials and, and younger generations, the primary way of consuming music. So it is Is going, that true for everyone? I'm is curious, is that be, true for everyone in the audience? For, for streaming music, put your hands up if you've streamed music. Whoa. Okay, so you're right, it is the primary way. How big of a song do you have to have to make like reasonable royalties off of streaming? You have to be Drake. You have to be Drake. Is that the answer? That's the answer. First off, YouTube, which is paying the least, is the world's biggest music streaming service. If you took all those YouTube uh, music listeners and converted them to $9.99 a month, they would be paying a lot more money than the average person pays. That's why if we convert all listeners to subscribers, streaming can be the future and it could begin to pay better not just for labels, but to artists. But that is also not going to happen if there continue to be deals where individual artists silo themselves with individual right. streaming services. Right, and that's what's right happening, now, I right? subscribe to Tidal, I subscribe to Apple Music, I subscribe to Spotify's paid tier because I want access to everything. It's part of my job. And most people but, don't do yeah, that, If I was right? a 22-year-old kid, no, I'd just be stealing everything. Do you think streaming makes it harder or easier for young artists to break through? I think it's probably easier than ever to make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. I think it's harder than ever to make a lot of money. If you are of the mindset that all your favorite musicians should be multimillionaires, then you should have been born 25 years earlier. Let's move on to our next step. 
$163. That's the amount millennials spend on music in a typical year. As for where and how they spend it, here's the split. 29% goes to live performances, 12% to digital tracks and albums, 9% to CDs and vinyl, and another 9% to streaming services. Joe, $163 doesn't sound like a lot of money. The live music industry is actually doing quite well. Yeah. Uh, and, th and that is the experience that people want to have and that they are most interested in paying for. We're talking about festivals, live events. You go to something like Coachella, you mm -hmm. go to a Bonnaroo, it's I want a taste of this, I want a taste of that, I want a taste of this. I don't know if that's good for artists anymore because when people is go to Coachella, they're going for an experience, they're going for this sort of branded experience where I, yeah, I can get a little Vic Mensa, yeah, I can get a little Lucius, I can get all these artists, but do I really feel committed to any of them? Am I walking out on Sunday night? And you Sunday think that night? commitment is important? I think that's actually the metric. Like all of these charts are fine, but the real no, the real metric yeah. is fan engagement. I want to ask if anyone here is in a band. Do you have anyone that's in a band? You two, are you in a band together? <laughs> We're in a band called Red Oblivion. We also play in a band called Ellen and the Degenerates. And can I ask if you're making any money out of those careers? We do nine to fives, but we have made money. It's so you fun. have to work other jobs on the side. Absolutely. Yeah. And are those other jobs music related or not? Uh, sometimes, a lot of times what we find that we have to do is like work in lots of different bands. Nowadays with a lot of musicians you have to just like put all your eggs in all these different baskets rather than just like, focus on one project. You just have to put yourself everywhere. I think that's a great lead. Look at this next stat. You can be a young musician with a following and still not make much money. A quarter of US musicians and singers last year and a grand total of $13.20 an hour. It's pretty depressing, right? That's actually way better than I would have thought. No way. I mean, I'm not saying that that's great, but it's, there's no federally mandated minimum wage for being a cool musician. But is it sustainable then? Don't most people just drop out of the industry if that's how much money that they're making? I mean, I think probably the secret truth is it was never really sustainable, but I also think that artists uh, who can find fan bases have quicker paths to mm -hmm. monetization today than they did five or 10 years ago. I and mean, when they were just big record labels, it you either got on the you either got on the ship or you didn't get on the ship. Now there's a hundred different ships. It's more of a level playing field, right. which means, for example, on SoundCloud, we have 12 million artists that are heard every month. The competition that's out there and the need to really manage your, your profile, manage a relationship with the fans, it's kind of in your hands. But the flip side is there's a lot more competition for attention and, and eyeballs. Even though musicians make so little from streaming, it's not the worst option. Here's why. 57 million Americans get music from pirate sites, which pay musicians and the industry nothing at all. Joe, when did this start and how did it become a habit? You know, this all starts with Napster. That's the moment that peer-to-peer -peer becomes a reality okay. and the moment it becomes a reality and that digital content can be traded over high-speed internet, mm -hmm. uh, the perfect storm has come together uh, for the music industry and the bottom falls out very, very quickly. I do think the threat of piracy looms on it's the It's still there. Yeah. And it's still there if it starts to crack and if the support of streaming mm. starts to dissolve. I think there is there is a risk that this number gets gets bigger. But say say you're a young person with no credit card. You don't you can't sign up for a premium streaming service. You're fluent with how to get stuff on the internet. Um, you're gonna get that Frank Ocean record. You're gonna get it within ten mm -hmm. minutes of when everybody else gets it. So how is piracy working now? Very, very robustly is my understanding. Can, can I, actually, I want to take a really, really quick, I want to take a quick poll of the room to kind of figure out how prevalent it is. Has anyone here ever downloaded That's music watching. illegally? Watching. Hey, even the musicians downloaded music illegally. <laughs> Guys. I think if you, if you are Generation Z and you were growing up, you are growing up in a streaming world where the number of alternatives you have, both ad-supported and subscription, that you can choose to use, that is very different than the generation that grew up in the Napster, in the Napster mm -hmm. era that right. got kind of locked into that behavior. I think we have an opportunity to dramatically reduce this number as the but, next generation of music consumers come up. But unfortunately, that actually does it for this edition of The Business of Life. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today, Joe, Stephen and John, and thank you all for watching at home. We'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Business of Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at BetterMoneyHabits.com.